Hey everyone, my name is Eric Jones. I am the Turf Teacher and I would like to welcome you to the course entitled Reading a Landscape and Irrigation Plan. And what we're going to do in this course, um, we're going to look at a landscape plan done by one of my students. Uh, it's in the second year design classes and it is a plan that I think that um, is represented well. It's drawn graphically uh, to detail. Uh, I mean, the graphics is just unreal for this. And, and this is pretty much what most of my students are doing uh, in second year design class. Uh, and it is also something that I love seeing the landscape contractors do uh, for uh, residential sites. I love the hand-drawn plan. And I truly, truly believe that once you know how to correctly hand draw a plan, then you start moving into AutoCAD, start moving into Pro Landscape and, and some of the other design softwares out there. But I, I really believe uh, in my heart that uh, you need to learn how to hand draw first. Then the AutoCAD and the computer generated graphics comes second nature. Um, but uh, in this lecture, uh, you're going to see a couple of worksheets also about uh, how to read a scale. There's two worksheets that's going to be loaded up on the uh, the website for you to download and uh, and practice. Um, um, you know, drawing lines uh, with with the scales uh, that we typically use in landscape design, and that's always something. It's it's um, you know using a scale. Uh, I've you know I could do it almost blindfolded. Because uh, I can count the ticks with my finger or with the pencil, um, but if you don't, if you don't use it, you lose it. And a lot of my students, when we when we learn uh, how to read a scale and how to read a plan in the landscape construction class, and then we start getting into design classes uh, a couple semesters later, they tend to forget how to use um, uh, the graphic scales that uh, that we use to to do our landscape design. So uh, that's part of this course. Um, and then you'll have some questions on the, the landscape plan that uh, that you're getting ready to see. And it'll also be uploaded in a PDF, so you can open up the PDF and zoom in uh, on the plan as long as you have uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader. But with that being said, let's get started. Here is the plan that uh, we are going to look at. And again, it is going to be on the website. All you got to do is click on it and it'll blow up. Uh, and here we have a property. Uh, it's in Clemens, North Carolina. And, and to be honest with you, this, is a, this was my first house uh, that I built for sale uh, once I got my uh, general contractor's license. I built it in a little community in Clemens, North Carolina. Uh, you know, started when the market was great. So, you know, I actually sold the house before we finished it and uh, had the site survey. It's a house that we draw every year in my design class at the college. We do the landscape. It's a good small yard for, for my students to start with, but it's a, a very good detailed landscape plan here. Um, you know, we got the front yard, so you know the porch is facing to the north, so they've got uh, you know a lot of shade there, and you know the homeowner's always sitting on the porch usually when I drive by, but, you know, very small front lawn, but, uh, you know, some nice uh, curvilinear design there from, from my student. Um, uh, you know, driveway, you know, takes up most of the yard, uh, but it comes in. And in this neighborhood here, all the driveways had to be on the same side. So uh, the neighbor's house over here, the driveway is right here. And that gives that that visual separation instead of the houses being, you know, next to each other and being able to stick your arm out and shake hands uh, from window to window. So the developer made us all put the driveways, um, you know, to the left, but they've got the driveway, they come in here, the garage is here. And so we do have a lot of concrete. Then we have a nice little turf area in the back. Uh, but uh, we're gonna answer, you know, I'm gonna ask some questions about the plan. You're gonna scroll in, zoom in on it on the PDF, and then just answer it in the Moodle site. So, uh, but proud of my student. I took his name off uh, of it. But uh, again, when it goes back to us being landscape contractors and irrigation contractors, um, if we can draw this uh, very quickly and um, in, in this detailed to, to show our clients what we're representing, I think we're, we're doing ourselves uh, a good thing. 
And I love going back to the hand drawing. Yes, everybody got on the kick of AutoCAD, and it's still necessary. Guys, don't get me wrong. AutoCAD is still necessary for commercial projects and for uh, you know zoning issues. And, and when you're submitting plans for that, yes, you got to do it on CAD. But there's nothing like getting a residential design and being able to sit down and go back to, to our basics and, and, and go back to, to, for one of the reasons that, that I studied landscape architecture was the, the graphics part of it. I loved landscaping. I loved um, everything I did growing up working in my parents' business. And, and when I found out about what landscape architecture was and, and figured that I could combine drawing with um, landscaping, it, it was a no-brainer for me. It's, uh, it was uh, the best decision of my life. And to be able to teach students how to draw like this and to, and, and to get them excited in a career field such as landscape architecture or landscape design uh, really, really uh, means a lot to me. But again, I'm gonna put this up in a PDF. Uh, you'll be able to uh, download it, print it. Um, you know, you, you, if you've got a large format printer, you could probably print it on 11 by 17. But if not, you're gonna be able to uh, click on this PDF and zoom in from uh, Adobe Reader. And so landscape and irrigation plan reading. It is basically interpreting and reading uh, the plans allows the landscape or irrigation contractor to what? It's gonna allow us to understand what the landscape architect or designer wants. What are the intentions of the site? Sometimes we're going to question what the designer was doing. That's, that's, that's our nature. We're in the field every day. We see uh, uh, problems that arise and we see you know, easy ways to fix it. And, and, and sometimes the designer may not be out in the field. I love the design builder, uh, the landscape architect or designer who uh, is in the office designing it, but also the one that's installing it. That is... Um, you know, to me, the way to do it. But there are some great designers out there, great landscape architects out there, but then there are also some that may lack um, details when it comes to the plant materials. They, they may or may not have had the opportunity uh, to study plant materials uh, in, in their uh, programs. It just depends on which schoolhouse they come from. If, if they took landscape architecture in a school of agriculture, where, where I did at a at, uh, and we were housed in the school of agriculture. So I got plant science, soil science, plant materials one and two, advanced plant materials. All that was taken care of. Maybe if they were in the school of design somewhere that the college didn't have a uh, school of agriculture, they may not have got as much uh, plant material exposure. Uh, as, as someone in the School of Ag or, or someone who went through a horticulture program or has been in the field uh, as long as you guys have. So there's nothing wrong with that. I've also seen uh, architects um, that were, you know, from the Midwest designing plans for here in North and South Carolina. So, you know, some of the plant material was, was a little bit off and, you know, have that open relationship with them. Uh, if you see it on the plan, there's nothing wrong with picking up the phone and asking the architect, hey, I can't find this plant. It's just not grown here. I don't think it's going to do well based on this, based on that. And, you know, they'll work with you and we'll come up with a, a great plant substitution. So, but we are learning what their intentions of the site is by reading the plan. We're also going to be able to uh, understand the type of materials uh, that's going to be used in the location of these materials. So we're learning what's gonna be planted, what's gonna be built, and where at on the site. So that's all uh, taken care of uh, in the plan. And we're also going to be able to estimate the design and bid on the opportunity to do the work. Now, best thing about having a landscape plan, guys, or an irrigation design plan, and a lot of times, and I don't know, correct me wrong, send me a, send me a DM or, or an email and, and kind of let me know what you guys are seeing. But from my experience when working for my parents in the field, uh, a lot of the times there were not irrigation plans. You know, yes, some, some commercial sites that we installed had already had the irrigation plan done. But when it comes to doing a residential landscape plan and there was a landscape architect hired, they would just say, give us a quote on the irrigation and then want us to do an as built uh, irrigation plan. And that's, that's fine. That's totally okay. But what I'm kind of seeing is that some of the landscape architects didn't 
didn't really know enough to to design the irrigation system. So just don't, I don't know, kind of curious about what you guys are seeing out there now. Are you getting are you getting a set of drawings that actually has an irrigation plan or are they asking you guys to give a quote on the irrigation and then be able to do a as built irrigation plan and and that's perfectly fine as licensed irrigation contractors uh, we are responsible for doing as built and it is a good thing to uh, uh, to give our clients once we uh, complete the uh, irrigation system um, some common elements of the plan we have the title block um, and that's usually going to be down at the bottom um, uh, or uh, to the right hand side if, if you're facing the drawing. It's either going to be on the very bottom or on the right hand side. That's going to include uh, your north arrow. You're going to have uh, a legend, which could be your plant materials, um, a list or a plant list that's on the plan. That's not going to be in the title block. Your title blocks basically going to include your north arrow, who drew it, the site location, the name of the owner, the name of the designer. Uh, the designer's logo, um, your uh, uh, North Carolina landscape contractor seal, your irrigation seal or your landscape architect seal, all that's going to be down in the title block. Um, your legend is going to be like your plant list or any other um, uh, list of things that are on the plan. You may have some specifications that you're going to put on a plan, maybe even a planting detail or uh, a detail on how to complete the hardscape, um, you know, and on the plan that we see here, there, you know, there's some planters that were put in uh, as as part of a uh, uh, of, as a construction drawing. And then you also you're going to see the scale, and the scale is going to be located in the title block itself, along with the date that the drawing has uh, been completed, and it may say, you know, um, drawing one of ten drawing two of 10, and it'll also name the drawing. So if this is the uh, planting plan, if this is the irrigation plan, if this is the um, um, master plan or, or you know, whatever we're titling uh, the drawing, but you're gonna see that um, on the title block. And I'm gonna scroll back here uh, to the plan. Down here is your, you know, your title block. Again, the project for, uh, for that class was designed in the Landscape Project 2. Uh, it was uh, HR 112, Landscape Design 1. I was the instructor. It was the fall of 16. And then the student had their information there, which I had to uh, block out. I put my logo in there, guys, just representing uh, for you guys how you could actually uh, set up your title block. And then we had the north arrow, and it was drawn, scale, and then the date it was uh, turned in in December. Uh, of 16. So that is your title block. If we had the planting details, they are over here. Um, maybe a little crowded there, but you know, you had some room down here to do a plant list. Uh, the student here did the, uh, the construction details uh, for, uh, for the planters. So um, good way to, to show that. And um, you know, some of our designs, guys, uh, are going to be just one page. Uh, plans. You know, if we're doing an irrigation plan or an as-built for somebody, it's going to be one sheet of paper. If we're doing uh, just a, you know, small landscape design for somebody, it's probably just going to be one sheet of paper. Your commercial jobs, you know, you could get a roll of documents for it. And then not only the specs that are on the plan, but you've got the specifications uh, that are that are put together in like a notebook for you. And you need to read those as long as uh, as long as they're there, sometimes the builder's not going to want to give it to you. You may have to ask uh, the builder for a copy of the specifications or, or ask the landscape architect because that's where they're going to get you. Everything is going to be laid out word for word in the specs um, and uh, versus the uh, what's on the plan. And another thing to, to note when it comes to reading the plan, um, in the plant list, let's say if we had uh, the plant list right here. And it said that there were, you know, 22 Indian hawthorns. And we go in here on the plant, and let's, I don't know if there's Indian hawthorns right here, I can't remember. But let's say all these were Indian hawthorns, and we're saying that there's 20, 22 in the plant list, but we counted 24. What do we go by? Do we go by what's actually drawn in, or do we go by what's on the plant list? you better go for what's actually drawn. If you've counted 24, 
turn in 24 with your estimate, not 22 on the plant list. Because sometimes the, the designer may just miss one or two and over uh, different groups of plants, next thing you know, you may be missing 10 plants altogether on the job and uh, it's just money out of your pocket. Um, well, there I did, we blew the title block up. Uh, it's information collected in a box or a rectangle. Um, either, uh, either on the side of the drawing or at the bottom. And it just really depends on how you're setting your, um, setting up your, uh, setting up your drawing. You can get pre-printed um, border and title block uh, paper to draw on. That's fine. Uh, I prefer to draw my border and to draw my uh, title block in because I like getting a little fancy with it. I, um, I just like being creative. I like being able to, uh, to orient it the way that I want to. So um, I'm always going to draw it. I'm always going to buy the blank sheets of paper, not on a roll. I'm actually spend a little bit of extra money and, and buy the sheets, pull them out, draw my border, draw my title block, and I can set it up the way I want to. And like I said, again, it should contain uh, the project name, the client's name, the date, sheet title, and the scale. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about scale here in a few minutes. Um, your north arrow, it's a symbol that uh, indicates where north is. And on this plan, north is uh, to the right. Uh, so if you're sitting on the front porch and looking out, you're looking towards the north. So they're going to have a um, you know, nice shady front yard. Uh, so they can sit out there in the hot summers on the front porch and uh, watch the neighbors walk by on the sidewalk. Good thing about this uh, neighborhood that, that we did the design on, it's really a community that's, uh, um, you know, almost kind of forced to interact with the sidewalks and the street lamps. I mean, it's just, it's set up to, to get people outside and to, to meet their neighbors. Uh, but the north arrow, it orients the plan to the job site and it can be drawn in many different ways. And this is something else that I like to do. You can get fancy with your north arrow. You can draw it quickly to the point with just uh, uh, a line and uh, a triangle saying that's north with an N or you can get a little detailed uh, doing symbols like that. But, you know, it's totally up to you. You're the designer. You uh, uh, represent yourself on how graphically you can get with this. And then also with the uh, with my logo, I always put the logo on that. You can get your logo pre-printed on some of these um, um, 24 by 36 or 18 by 24 paper. You can go ahead and have it set up and pre-printed, but why not draw it? Um, I didn't draw, I didn't draw my logo here. I actually have it set up in Word that I can print to a sticky back and we just put it on the, the paper and so it gets photocopied when we run prints of the plan. So little quick, simple, easy things like that. Yes, uh, I am the turf teacher, but uh, I do have this logo set up for, uh, for my design uh, business as well. So, um, Trying to think of anything else I need to tell you about the title block. Um, again, make sure that, you know you got the sheet drawing. That's a big thing because there may be um, five sheets of drawings or maybe ten. Uh, it just depends. So make sure that you have them all. Legend uh, symbols that indicate what they represent. Um, you know, here is just a generic one that that I found. You know. Uh, they've got perennials, shrubs, they've got a couple trees. Um, but they're listing the, the common name, botanical name, and the quantity. Uh, usually I like to put the size on there. Uh, so if I'm doing the, uh, the boxwood evergreen, am I getting it in a three gallon? Am I finding it in a two gallon? Uh, what about my trees? Um, am I, are they B and B? What's the minimum caliper? Uh, if they're in a container, is it a 15 gallon? Uh, so you need to specify um, the sizes on there, the sizes that you're going to purchase them at uh, should also be in the legend. Uh, and why do we need to put the botanical name? 
Uh, you know, and I get that question a lot from the students. Um, you know, what do we got to learn both the common and the botanical name? Well, a, as a professional, you should know it anyway. But throughout, um, you know, different areas of the United States, the common names may be different uh, uh, for the for the same with a plant. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example. But if we know the botanical name, the botanical name is going to be the botanical name across the United States, across the world most of the time. Um, it's going to be in Latin or, you know, um, the botanical name is always going to be the botanical name. But, you know, here in the southeast, we may call a shrub different than they call it in uh, the Washington, D.C. area or even further north. It just depends on the location. Everybody come, kind of comes up with their common name. So we got to go by the botanical name and, you know, Make sure that when you when you call the nurseries and you're trying to locate these plants that you're that you're getting them, um, um, you know, uh, by the botanical name. So, um, you know, if not, a landscape architect may catch it and and not. You know, we had an instance where uh, we were trying to find some red oaks to put on a plan. Um, having a little bit of difficulty finding it. One of the nurserymen said, well, you can use a pin oak. And yeah, I mean, I understand that. Uh, but the designer didn't like that. They wanted the true, uh, a true red oak. And so we had to, we had to, to go and locate it and find it instead of using the pin oak. So um, sometimes your nurserymen can help you out with that or, um, or they can kind of recommend uh, the wrong thing. Always go by botanicals. Now, specifications. Now. Uh, like I said, they're either going to be in a spiral notebook like this or a three ring binder. Um, they are instructions and requirements for implementing the design. Um, and guys, we've got some horror stories about that. And I'm sure you guys have too. Uh, a friend of mine was working uh, for a company. Um, they were installing, it, it, was, it, was, it was over a hundred trees and they were doing it in an area, uh, it was like a new park. And the, uh, they went ahead and planted all the trees and without reading the specifications. Well, the landscape architect that designed the project come rolling up one day. Uh, they were still there. They were, you know, finishing up, you know, seeding and strawing and uh, make sure everything was watered. You know, it was one of the last few days of the, the project. It was a, you know, multi-week project with a hundred trees and grass and shrubs to be planted. Um, with the landscape architect pulled up in a truck, got out with a shovel and a rake and a set of plans, walked over to one of the trees and raked the mulch back, started digging around the tree and uh, looked and saw that um, the wire baskets were still on the B&B &B trees. Now, you're probably freaking out thinking, well, they're supposed to be, and I 100% agree. I would never take the wire basket off of a B and B tree when I planted it. It's it's there for a reason. It's there to hold, uh, you know, that root ball in place to give it some structure. And the landscape architect, in the project specifications, wrote that all wire baskets must be removed prior to planting them. And so, and this landscape architect came out and actually inspected his design, which he should. I mean, they really should. They should really take enough pride in uh, their work and to make sure that their stuff's getting installed uh, to the way that they've asked it to be done. Now, granted, if my friend had read the specifications, he could have called the landscape architect and give their point of view from it. They could have also talked to the owner and explained to them why they think the wire baskets should be left on. But since he did not read the specifications, um, my buddy had to dig up all the trees, remove the wire baskets, and then plant them back. And it cost him a lot of money. It cost the company a lot of money to have to do that. But all they had to done was read the specifications and then argue their point or demonstrate why we should leave the wire baskets on it and give documentation or just simply say, if I'm gonna have to remove the wire baskets, this is a job 
that I don't want to, to take on. It's going to be too much risk. You know, the trees could die. I'm just not willing to do it. Go ahead and get the next bidder. So read the specifications. Another horror story. Uh, this is a good friend of my dad's. Uh, bid a job. Uh, it was uh, uh, some apartments. I'm not going to tell you the city, but uh, bid the job. Got the job. Uh, got the landscape job on the apartments. It was a pretty big job, but did not read the specifications. The specifications stated that the landscape contractor is to include in their total price for the project one year maintenance uh, of the property. Now, granted, this was a large apartment complex, several several buildings with uh, several units in it. You know, had a pool, had parking lot, had you know, it was it was a nice setup. They did a really nice job on the landscaping, uh, and it it was. Uh, it was a good project for him, but for the next 12 months, since he didn't include the price on maintenance, he had to send a crew down there once a week to mow it, um, take care of it. They had to remulch it again. You know, there wasn't much pruning to be done, but, uh, you know, sweeping the parking lot, blowing off the parking lot. They were sending crews down there uh, every week for the next year at no charge. Uh, because they forgot to include it in their final bid price. And if they had read the specifications, they would have um, known to do that. So guys, you've got to ask for it. They don't want you to have the specifications. And I've even had builders, why do you need that? I'll give you a set of plans, go figure the job. No, I'm not going to figure the job unless I have the specifications for the project, because that's lined you know, word for word, what you need to do. And if you go to court, if you have to get sued because of a job or you have to sue because you haven't been paid, the judge is always going to want to see the project specifications. That That's what's going to uphold in court, not the actual drawing. So make sure you get a copy and make sure you read it. Um, they also ensure the level of construction and installation quality. Um, that's, um, you know, again, you're supposed to be doing it uh, per the designer's uh, wishes. And that's why the, the, the owner has hired the landscape architect or the designer to have somebody put their input and to show, and, and again, I hate using this term, but the plans are in layman terms. It's to, to, to help us understand their design ideas and it ensures that they've got that good quality construction and, and, and to install it properly. However, always double check. Guys, there's nothing wrong with questioning um, some of the um, things that they've asked us to do, whether it's the, the correct plant material or even the wire basket situation as we saw. But the, the specs are gonna include site prep, excavation, soil preparation, um, planting, mulching, uh, and then even clean up. And, and again, <laughs> we're the last ones in, so we're pretty much cleaning up everybody's mess. Uh, you know, how many times have we had to pick up brick in the soil bed, in the uh, shrub beds? How many times are we having to deal with paint cans or, you know, washing out the paint cans uh, and it, right there next to the house where we're planting, uh, you know, plants that, that's not gonna do well with that. Um, and even with your soil prep, the specs are going to tell you how deep to prepare the soil, what amendments to put in, all that's going to be in your uh, specifications. And, you know, how many times have we gone out and just planted stuff and not prepared the soil bed? Well, I guarantee if we read the, the, the project specifications, it's going to it's going to call for that. But our competitors that we're bidding against aren't doing all that soil amendments uh, that we should be doing. Now, scales. Um, this is how we measure uh, the plans. It identifies the relationship of the distance on the design and the distances on the actual site. So think about it really as like a model car. Model cars are to detail and they are, you know, shrunk down, um, you know, to this little model car. But if you blew it up at like, one to 20 scale or whatever at 20 times or 25 times. I'm not real sure how they do the model cars, but then you've got the full size car. 
That's what we're doing with the piece of paper. We're taking the site and we're shrinking it down and putting it on a piece of paper. And so when we say one inch, so literally one inch on a tape measure is equivalent to 20 feet out at the site. So that's at 20 scale. And so what are the most popular scales that we use in landscape design? They are um, one to 10, one inch equals 10 feet, one inch equals 20 on the engineer scale. So we're using 10 and 20. I have seen 30 scale on some commercial properties. Um, I hadn't really ran across one in um, uh, residential design. And then if we're using architect, and architects are going to be bigger drawings, so either it's a small lot uh, on the, the large piece of paper, or it may be drawing our details um, to uh, with the architect scale. And we're either going to use one eighth of an inch equals a foot, or a quarter inch equals a foot. Um, but it can be shown graphically, the actual scale itself can be shown graphically or written and marked off in inches or fractions of an inch. So you may see on the plan where it just says one inch equals 20 feet, or the designer may actually draw it graphically showing one inch equals 20 feet. And there's all kinds of fancy ways uh, to put your scale on the plan um, uh, to tell the landscape contractor uh, what, what size you drew it in. Um, architect scale, it's units of an inch. It is, uh, you know, for example, uh, a quarter inch equals a foot. So um, it's going to be your, your larger size drawing. It's going to take up the most room on the paper. So um, again, details, you're not going to see a two dimensional plan. You're not going to see a site plan really in, in, in quarter inch of a foot. You may, you might see eighth. But quarter scale, you're probably going to be uh, drawing your details. Uh, an eighth inch, and sorry, that's supposed to uh, be um, a quarter inch, uh, are the most common scales. Um, they're architectural units. The distance is read in feet, inches, and fractions of an inch, and primarily used for residential properties. Yeah, you might see it on, again, construction details on a commercial site. You'd probably draw in quarter, uh, quarter scale. But... Um, Probably the harder scale to read, definitely with my students, uh, because it is uh, in in feet and fractions. Um, I don't know. It's um, you know you either get this or you don't, uh, but it is something that you can work on. But once you remember how to do it, you you've got it. It becomes second nature, and if you're doing it every day. But uh, uh, again, you know. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Just like with plant material, you'll uh, you'll forget how to do it. I use them every single day of my life, uh, so it just comes, you know, you know, second nature. And, and and sometimes I have to admit I get a little frustrated with my students because they they can't they can't read the scales. And we've gone over multiple multiple exercises, and 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 sometimes it just it just takes them a bit to get it. You know, they'll learn how to do it in construction class, you know, we're measuring plans, we're doing takeoffs, we're, we're going out and we're building stuff. And so they're, they're getting it. And then, you know, a semester later, we get to design and it's like, oh, wow, I forgot how to do this. Um, but anyway, engineer, units of increments in an inch, how many tick marks per inch? And the best thing about the engineer scale is if you do forget how to read it and you've got the 10 scale on there, you know that one tick represents a foot. So one inch equals 10 feet. You just literally count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. There is um, 10 feet. One, uh, one tick is a foot uh, on the 10 scale. Um, there are plans that are drawn in decimal units. The distance is read in feet and tenths of a foot and is definitely used for commercial properties. And we're primarily going to see 10 scale, 20 scale, and even 30 scale on the uh, the commercial properties. Um, a buddy of mine, landscape architect, he pretty much draws everything in 30 scale. It seems like every plan that I've seen uh, from him, he'll bring me you know plans here by the college for the students to practice with and stuff, and uh, everything's uh, in 30 scale that he's brought. Um, but this is the easier one to catch, and you know we're drawing site plans, so. Um, you know, probably going to be the one we use the most. 
All right, now here's uh, the two worksheets. Uh, they'll be on Moodle. Um, I'm not going to ask that um, you upload them or turn them into me. Uh, but what we do here, this will give you an opportunity to download the, the Architect Scale Lab and the Engineer Scale Lab and just practice drawing with the scale. Um, it's, uh, it's a good exercise uh, to have. Uh, if you want, you could take a picture and uh, you know, send it to me uh, in email. Uh, we all have our handy uh, cell phones that uh, allows us to take pictures and email to people. So um, just to, if you wanted to show me that you did it. Um, but if you do do it, you'd need an engineer scale, an architect scale, and then uh, a triangle or a straight edge. And, and guys, what I recommend when, when I give these labs to my student, I, I take my triangle and I draw a straight line straight down in between the numbers and the D's where it's saying draw. So I've got a perpendicular line, and it's perpendicular to the bottom down here, perpendicular on, so that I have a straight edge to draw a 20 foot line, to draw the 120 foot line, to draw the 55 line. That way it's easier to be graded and you have a straight edge to work off. Now, I always tell people when you're using a scale, don't use the scale, don't hold your scale and then draw a line on the scale. Once you get this line drawn in between the numbers, take your scale, put it on the zero, find the 20 foot line on the one inch equals 20, so it's actually gonna be about right in there somewhere, put a dot, and then take your triangle or straight edge and draw the line to the point. Never draw with your scale. It just doesn't work, it just doesn't, and, 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 and trust me, do one line each and you'll see which looks better. Uh, you might get the, the, the pencil caught in the groove uh, of the tick mark and it kind of throws it off. So you want to you wanna mark your points with the scale and then take your triangle or straight edge to draw the line. So, But anyway, these two worksheets will be uh, on the Moodle site for you to do. I'm not going to take them up. You don't have to turn them in to me. Uh, it, it's, it's for you to practice. Estimating, it's the process of calculating the quantities of materials and construction costs associated with a project. These plans are gonna allow us to bid the jobs. We're gonna come up with an estimate from it. We get to quantify the es uh, quantify estimates are based on measurements taken either on site or directly from a landscape plan. And the quantities allow cost determinations for materials, labor, equipment, and subcontractors. And the plan that is in this lecture, you should be able to take it Figure the job. If you had a life-size printout of the, 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 the site, you should be able to take your scale, measure how much turf is there, measure how much mulch and pine needles there, count the plant material. If you're pouring the sidewalks and the, and the um, driveway, you'd be able to figure out how many, uh, uh, how many yards of concrete. Uh, I mean, you could do a good cost estimate with the plan that uh, is here in this lecture. So linear calculations. We're gonna talk a little bit about linear uh, area volume, stuff like that. Uh, it's just, it's a review. Uh, I'm sure most of you guys already know it, but perimeter distance, um, we're gonna use linear calculations to, to do perimeter distance. Say if we're doing, um, um, you know, shrub bed lines or metal edging, any type of thing like that. How long is the wall? Um, that's our linear type measurements. Um, and even in irrigation uh, estimates, we're gonna figure out how long the main line is, how long the lateral lines are. All those are linear calculations. Um, perimeter of a rectangle. You know, perimeter is just A plus B plus A plus B. So if A is three units and B is five units, the distance, then you've got three plus five plus three plus five equals 16. And we're saying units, um, units, I mean, it could be in feet, it could be in meters, it could be in inches, whatever type units that we're using. But that is the perimeter of a rectangle. Um, perimeter of a parallelogram, um, you have P equals two times A plus B. So examples given, 
A are 17 meters, B is 18 meters, and so P equals 2 times A plus B equals 2 times 17 plus 18 equals 2 times 35, and we have the perimeter of 70 meters. Now, trapezoid, a little, little, uh, uh, little different. All we're doing is P equals A plus B plus C plus D. So A uh, plus the B plus the C plus the D. That is your, uh, your linear perimeter of the trapezoid. Linear calculations on the circumference of a circle. Um, C is the circumference all the way around the circle. D is the diameter. And so uh, we have the, uh, the circumference uh, is pi times D. So um, pi is you know constant 3.14 and it's gonna be multiplied by the, the distance uh, or the diameter of the circle um, for, to calculate the circumference. Um, triangles, A plus B plus C. Again, all this is review. So, area calculations. Measure of a surface within a closed boundary. It's the number of given, uh, number of ground cover plants or quantity of sod. It is expressed in square units, whether it's square inches, square feet, square yards. Uh, we're, we're talking about areas of the lawn, areas of mulch beds. Uh, but let's say we're just, we're just figuring out lawn. We're figuring out how many square feet uh, that we need to apply uh, fertilize to. We're actually taking an area calculation um, uh, of the site to see how much we need. And that's basically length times width. So of a rectangle, it's the area is your length times your width. If it's a triangle, it's gonna be one half times the base times the height. So base times height times one half will give us the area of a triangle. And not too many times are we gonna be calculating the area of a lawn that's shaped in a triangle. Everything's pretty much gonna be uh, pretty much rectangular. It's gonna have some curvilinear uh, areas in it, but when it comes to that, I'm always overestimating a little bit. I'm giving myself the benefit of the doubt. Um, parallelogram again is area uh, is equivalent to base times the height. Uh, the trapezoid is one half times the base plus top times the height. So we've got the uh, we've got our base and we've got our top. We're going to add them together. It's going to be half of that times the height. So one half times B plus T times H. The area of a circle uh, is pi R squared. Pi from the previous slide we realize is 3.14 and we're going to do the radius times itself. So pi R squared or 3.14 times R times R. Um, and here Let's say we work for a golf course, and this is a good simple way, or this could be, this could actually literally be uh, somebody's backyard. Um, but we're trying to figure out uh, the, uh, the number of square feet in the yard here. So we're going to measure a line along the axis of the area. So we're going to draw a straight line across. Then we're going to measure the width at right angles to the length and make multiple measurements at equal distances. So A, uh, we're perpendicular to this line. B, the same. You know, we're measuring a distance over here, and then from B to C, it's the same distance. We're doing perpendicular lines all the way from A, B, C, D, E, and then add all the measurements and divide by the number of measurements taken to get the average width. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So we measure A at 10, B is 16, C is 20, D is 25, E is 18. So that average uh, width is A plus B plus C plus D plus five. So 10, 16, 20, 25 added together, divided by five equals 17.8. And we have the length at 47 feet. So we're gonna take 47 and multiply it by the 17.8. And we're coming up roughly with 836 uh, 836 square feet for this uh, irregular shape 
um, turf grass area. Uh, volume is space within a three-dimensional area used to determine the amount of topsoil, mulch, and concrete. Uh, it is expressed in cubic units, either cubic feet or cubic yards. Um, and this is another another tricky one um, for the students. I, and, I, and I love teach I love teaching landscape calculations, or we call it construction math, where we actually have to figure out how much concrete's in the driveway, how much mulch is on the property. I think it's a little tricky, but you know, by the end of end of the semester, they are on top of uh, estimating. So, um, it is basically um, the volume is the area of the base times the height. So, uh, V equals A times B times H, and so here is our H. It's our height. Um, we, we're getting our area, so it's base times the height times the area and so it, it's really it's really our depth and uh, um, you know the one thing you know converting from um, cubic feet to cubic yards uh, you know you're dividing by 27 that's kind of a tricky thing uh, but when, once you get the habit of it you, you've got it it's it's, it's fun seeing my students uh, figure that out here is a cylinder uh, calculation that our students are having to do in greenhouse uh, production class all the time. They're trying to figure out how much soil that they're going to need if they're going to grow X amount of number of plants. So they're figuring out their soil medium, and that's basically uh, volume is pi r squared times the height, and it gets them their uh, volume for their uh, plant containers. The cone uh, is one third pi r squared times the height. Uh, it's a third area of the base and the height. Um, landscape contractor, we're not going to do that too much. Uh, and so here is a good example. A landscape plan calls for a rock finds to be installed. The walk is six feet wide by 20 feet long. So we have a uh, 120 square feet, right? If the rock finds are four inches thick, how many cubic yards will be required to complete the job? And this is typical landscape construction math that we do uh, in HOR 114. Uh, to find the solution to this problem, use the formula for uh, the volume of a cube, um, a to, uh, AB times H, so volume times the area of the base times the height. Convert the height from four inches uh, to feet, so you're working with the same units. Convert from inches to feet, divide by 12, so we've got four inches is 0.33 feet. And so we've got six times 20 times 33, and so we're going to need 90, uh, 39.6 cubic feet. Convert uh, to uh, the cubic yards, divide by 27, so we're needing a um, 1.47 cubic yards, or you know, uh, a yard and a half uh, of the uh, the rock finds. So simple stuff and again here is the worksheet uh, I will have a uh, uh, a few questions for you guys to answer on the landscape plan that's going to be separate than the quiz uh, for the lecture so there's there's two uh, assignments um, for um, um, for this uh, for this lecture so uh, again this will be loaded up in a PDF. You'll be able to open it up, expand, zoom in on it. There'll be uh, 10 questions to answer about the plan. And then there will be a 10 question quiz uh, just talking about the plan, uh, uh, the lecture itself. So um, just a little bit more to go. And guys, I appreciate uh, you taking the course. Uh, if you have any questions, there's my contact information. And uh, I'll see you in the next lecture. Thanks.